G'day by Frosters. So today we're going to do a little bit of work with rays. I'm not entirely sure where this is going to go, so I thought we could explore it together and uh, see where we went. So first off, I have a scene set up. Let's just close that back down. Nice little cannon. And I've set this up ready to receive some work here. You see there's a couple of locators out way out here. And there's a couple of locators here. And what these guys are going to do is going to, they're going to make it like a, a big pew pew laser beam for me. Because everybody likes that. And what I thought I'd do is create a ground plane and then use a ray intersection to find out where these guns hit and place something at that point. It should give you a good inter introduction to rays and I'll take you through it as I go. So let's get started. Let's go to the Bifrost Graft Editor and the first thing I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to get Excuse my very, very dodgy rig. I'm going to need to get in these locators. So that's beam start, beam end, beam start, beam end. So to get the positions of locators into Bifrost, you need to do a couple of things. First off, you need to have a look at your locators in the node editor. So we'll just close this down for now just to get it all started. So in the node editor, we need to have our, obviously have our locators in here. I'm just going to organize my node editor so it's a little bit easier to, to look at so it's beam start left beam end left beam start right beam end right so once you've got your, your locators ready to to drop in I'm just gonna expose all of their options here move these guys down so we'll jump back into our bifrost editor I create a value node. I'm going to make that value a vector, three point vector. I'm just going to hook this up here four times, and these are going to be our locators coming in. Three, four, and then I can delete this. So I'll rename this beam left start. Beam left end, right. Now we do right. And so it's important that you have these inputs already because, well, once we go back to our node editor, we're going to need to drop our Bifrost object into the node editor, like so. We just want the shape for now. Spread this out. So once you have, I, I hit three by the way. So one, two, three on the keyboard. Just like in Bifrost. You notice down here, here are our inputs. So for at this point, it just becomes a matter of hooking up the world position zero. What's this right beam right end into there? Press one to minimize that. This will be beam start right. I'll drop that in there. And then we can close that up as well. We'll do the same for the two shape, two lifts. So here's the beam end lift. And last but not least, beam lift start. Okay, so once those are all hooked up, you should be able to just put your node editor away. And let's try and get something going from here. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a couple of strands that go from the start locators to those two there, all the way out into the distance to the end locators. And we're not going to use these strands for anything, they're just to show us basically what we're doing. So to build strands, you need an array of points. So start and end. I'd rather hook those up three times than type it in at this hour of the evening. So now we've got two arrays and we can just quite simply go construct strands. 
don't worry about the strand offset because there's only two points. It's not going to be too much of a problem. And let's just pop these into the output and you can see there are our strands turning up. And here's the really nice thing about this. I can grab the, you know, I used to have a locator. There we are. I can grab this locator. So I'm not in Bifrost at the moment. And I can move it rotate it rather and you can see the beams just stay locked to the locators and because the locators are moving Bifrost is just drawing the strands for us so this is going to give us a good visual idea of what's going on and, and a way to mark what we're doing so we'll make a compound out of that just to keep it nice and tidy and we'll call that beam display and that's that done for now. We haven't done anything with rays yet, but we're about to. So let's get a really simple ground plane in there. Create mesh plane. Awesome. And put down a terminal for a bit more display. And leave the strands there on the output because I want them to always be there. I can file them away into an output and just leave them there for now. Whereas I can work with the terminal. And it gives me a little more control. Let's pop that plane mesh out to the let's, let's use the proxies. And we'll just set up some length and width that we like. So let's go for 100, 100. And it doesn't matter, but we'll give this some, some of that. And what we'll do is just move it forward in the Z about 45. There we go. So now we've got a nice flat ground plane. If you wanted to, you could uh, just, yeah, why don't we do it? make things a little more interesting and we'll get a fractal noise pop the positions into there we'll just use a displace points so we'll grab this, this guy here we'll put that there and we'll drop that back in the proxy and now we've got a really rough noisy fractal that we can play with. Uh, we want a little less frequency. So we got like maybe even a little less frequency. We got more like some hills there, magnitude of two, which is great. And number of frequencies is I will go with six. Let's make it a wee bit more oh, no maybe not we'll go with five. Make it a wee bit more interesting. The last thing I want to do is I'll just change the seed because I don't like this ridge here. Uh, randomly choose a seed and that'll be fine. <laughs> no, it won't because it's still got a big ridge right there. Just throw, keep throwing random numbers at it until it works. That's not really, yeah, because now we've got big dips as well. I'll tell you what, let's actually fix this. Let, let's fix this. So. We'll take the point positions again and we'll go back to 3 to scalar. We'll take the Z, run it into a set range. We'll set that range from 0 to 1. And we will multiply our fractal noise with, with that number and what that should get us. Hey, come on. Come on now. There we are. See, it's nice and flat there. It's nice and bumpy there. And we could do all kinds of things. We could uh, throw in a, an evaluate F curve in there if we wanted to, or we could just quite simply set that to say 0.5. So you've still got a little bit of movement down at this end. So it's not just totally flat. And we'll lift up our mesh plane by a tiny amount, say by 2. Oh, that's not tiny. 0.2. Let's deselect the Bryce Frost, see what we've got. Okay, that'll do. That'll do. So that, that's our setup. We'll just throw this in here as a compound. We'll call this ground plane. Or just ground will do. Just just to keep things tidy as we work. What I what I want to do is I want to find where those beams intersect the ground basically 
that's that's the goal of this. And then once I've got that, I can I can put some smoke on it, or put some particles on it, or do whatever I like. But the first, the very first step is to just, let's just center ourselves on that locator. So it's a bit easier to see. The very first step before we start doing cool things like building beams is we need to to get this ground interaction. We need to use a raycast for that. So I'm going to throw down a raycast, and that's not it. Let's build raycast accelerator. Get into that later. Get raycast locations is what we're going to use. Now this node works. I'll pop up the info bar so you can have a read while I chat and talk about it. And feel free to tell me where I get it wrong. The raycast location takes in a geometry, some positions, and some directions. So. What this is doing is it's saying this is the surface that you want to test for hits. So we already know what that is. That's our plane mesh. If you put that in there. That's our that's our ground. Except that's going to be the flat plane mesh that we brought in. The one we actually need to put into it is what comes out of the displacement. Okay, so this is the flat mesh, this is the bumpy mesh after being displaced. All good. The next thing is the position, which is the array of positions from which the rays originate. Now, we already did that up here, so let's just explode this and get back what we had. The positions from which the rays originate are the two points here, one, two, like this. They're the two locators, so they're the beam start locators. So we can just uh, throw down another bit of the ray, like this. And grab the start locators. There's start left, there's start right, and we can pop that into the positions. Getting pretty good. What we need now is the directions. Now, the direction is the direction of the ray, so it's going to start at these positions and go out in this direction. You can use a whole bunch of things for this normals, point positions. What we're going to do is we're going to calculate our own directions. And what our direction is, is essentially the strand oops uh, that, that happens a lot is essentially the strands the black strands coming through there so to get the direction from one vector to another you subtract the destination sorry you subtract the origin from the destination so we have our origins there's the start arrays there and let's let's do another one This might come back to bite me on the bum because I'm forever forgetting whether you subtract the destination from the origin or the origin from the destination, but that's easy enough to fix up. So we have our starts and we have our ends. Subtract. So we're subtracting the destinations, sorry, the subtracting the origins from the destinations and we'll put that into directions. Now nothing is happening. And nothing's happening because to see the rays we have to sample them. Sample property. It needs a geom geometry. It needs some locations. And it needs a value type in the default. And that's going to sample. By default that samples the point position. So we're going to sample the point position. I'm going to pop that down there for now and we're just going to have a quick look first with a location scope. So this is pretty simple. It's a location scope. It takes in usually the same geometry as your recording hits on and the start positions. So it knows where to draw the ray from. Let's, oh, better leave that on and put that up there. Now, what the location scope is going to do is draw an arrow, a circle, and, a, and uh, well, two circles. One circle at the origin and one circle at the sample. And then you've got size and size factors. The reason it's not showing us anything right now is because no rays are hitting. So I'm presuming that the rays are there. And if I was to move this down to the rays intersecting, I should see something, but I don't. And I'm wondering why. So let me just find that out. 
proximity method to line. And the other thing I can think of is reversing this array. Now it may not, it just may not have worked, is the other thing. You can see here this is actually getting a direction now from the origin because it, it has no idea where these start from the origin to these locators, these start locators. So this is actually this is actually working. If we plug that one in, it's not going to do terribly much at all because those locators are way down there. I know what the problem was. Let's plug the original ray back in. I bet you anything that this raycast location has cut off distance switched on. There we go. Plug that back into the array and there we are. So now if I just uh, if I just turn my strands off for a second by severing those connections, you can see that this is shooting out let me make this a bit bigger so we can actually see it. Shooting out a ray from each locator towards those locators all the way down there. Which means now if I move these around I'm getting the points at which the rays intersect the ground fairly accurately. Which is kind of nice. So this is about the simplest use case I can think of for a ray. I mean we're there. That's why rays work. If we want to do something with this we need to sample the property just like the location scope. Except all we need now is the locations and the geometry. So let's let's just copy a sphere to each of these points. So I'll do an instance. And I'll do a mesh sphere. Just a little one. A really small one. I need a point object as well, of course, if I'm going to use instances. So we're going to construct points. Pop that into there and let's move that up into the, into the proxy. So we can turn that off. Well, it's not a good idea to turn that off, is it? We'll drop that into the diagnostic. Now I think perhaps our mesh sphere was maybe a little small. There we go. So now, if you wanted to put particles from that point or uh, an aero volume for a little bit of dust kick up, you've pretty much got yourself a automatic, um, you've, you've pretty much got yourself a nice automatic and easy to, easy to use uh, mesh intersection tool. Okay. So let's have a quick look at what we did. We had a, had a scene set up where I just just set up some locators. If we just put that back up there. Ah, oh, by the way, you can see that when you don't hit anymore, your spheres disappear. It's, the instancing's not working. So I had a setup here with two two sets of locators. Locators at the start of the beam. This is going to be a laser cannon, and, and locators at the end of the beam. So that was the first thing we set up. Then we looked at how to get those into Bifrost using the node editor and the world position. World position zero of each locator. And we did that by going into Bifrost and creating some in empty inputs and then plugging them in, in the node editor. The first thing we did was we just built a couple of arrays here for some strands so that we could take a look at what we were doing as we were doing it. Then we made a, a interesting little ground plane with displaced points just to get a little bit of bump out of it. We then made our arrays of start and ends. So this is the array of the two start points and array of the two end points. And then we put down our get raycast location. We plugged our ground geometry in it because the rays will be intersecting the ground. We put our start points into the positions and then we subtracted our endpoints from our start points. That's right. Yeah, that's right. 
and that went into our direction. So that's telling telling Bifrost that the direction is the direction for the ray is from this point here to this point here. I'll, I'll double check that just to make sure the arrows are in the right place. I believe they are. You know, it's hard to tell with those spheres there, isn't it? Oh, that's just not really helping. Let's disconnect that entirely. Undo that a couple of times. Undo that one. Yeah. So this is our ray. You can see it has an arrow and it has a circle at the point where it hits. So we got our rays working after a little bit of tutoing around and fussing. But it was all good in the end. Have a nice little bit of accurate collision going on. Once that was done, we talked about putting a location scope so we could see where our rays were going to be and how that was set up. So the raycast location takes the geometry you're going to hit, the positions that the rays start from and the direction that they go in, and they, it produces a, an array of locations and an array of found. And found is quite simply, did I find something? Did I not find something? It's an array of trues or false. So, we wanted to have a look, we set up the location scope, the locations go in the top, the geometry that you are showing the locations on goes into geometry and the positions that the rays start at, which is here, goes into the position so that you can see. You can also plug the raycast directions in if you want to and then that just goes straight out to an output so it's producing these nice colors for us. You can turn off the arrows if you wish. Uh, you could definitely turn off the circles at origins because you know where those origins are. Uh, this is just showing us the results of our location, our raycast locations, and then we decided we might want to actually do something with that. So I just really quickly sampled the property, and the property I sampled was point position. I could, for example, sample the point normals at, at the intersection. So the property you're sampling, let's, let's do that as well. So I'll we'll copy that and paste it, because we need all the same inputs. And I'm going to say point normal. Okay. What are we going to do with the point normal? Well, if we change this to cube, pop that into our instance geometries here, and we can take our, go down here and get our point normal. And I can I believe you can set your point orientation. So what the, ah, thank you, Maxime. We can take our points come in. We can use the sample data here, which remember is our point normals. That can go to our orientations, and then we just plug the points back in to the create instances. And for some interesting reason, I've still got spheres going on in there. Oh no, there we go. So you can see that these are now are orienting themselves, so they match the normal of the surface that they're on. So I'll just go back down here and I'll, I don't know why it wants to give me spheres at the moment, but that's, that's kind of interesting, right? But you can see that the cubes are changing. Maybe not while you move them. So yeah, you can sample any kind of property from the surface that you like, as long as it have one, you could pick up the color. Um, you could do some very cool stuff, which I, I will try and do the next time I do a raise video. This is raise one, there'll be a raise two at least, uh, where you could calculate the angle of reflection and have things, some, some particles or something spit off the surface. Um, yeah, so anyway, once we set up our sample property, constructed our points, we just threw that into a quick instancer with originally spheres, but we've got some nice cubes now, and that went straight out. So that's pretty much a very basic introduction to rays um, and raycasting. There is so many awesome things you can do with raycasting. But I thought a bit of a laser rifle pew pew kind of thing would be kind of good. Uh, yeah, so keep an eye on the channel for rays 2, where I do something a bit more complicated with rays. 
that may or may not involve things like a gradient field, so we can do some interesting stuff there. I'll catch up with you next time. Thank you very much.